On this vote, the yeas are 180, the nays are 233. The motion is not adopted. The question is on passage of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Gentleman from Florida. I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. So the House is now voting on final passage of a bill that would create a committee to review EPA regulations with the intent to eliminate a number of regulations. This is a five-minute vote. In terms of what's happening next with reaching agreement on temporary funding for the federal government, we're hearing that there will be no weekend sessions now, no weekend sessions in either the House or the Senate. The next vote on temporary funding will be a procedural vote in the Senate, a vote on moving forward to a CR with the disaster aid included. And that would be temporary funding through November 18th with no offsets.
On this vote, the yeas are 249, the nays are 169. The bill is passed. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, that it adjourn to meet at noon on Monday, September 26, 2011, and further, when the House adjourn on that day, it shall meet at 11 a.m. on Thursday, September 29, 2011. Without objection. So ordered. House will be in order. Members will please take their conversations off the floor. The chair is prepared to take one minute requests. From what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Ms. I'm from Minnesota. Texas. What purpose of the Texas rise? Thank you. Request permission to address the House for one minute. Mr. Speaker, will suspend. The House will be in order. The members will take their conversations from the floor. The members will take their conversations from the floor. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, ever since we found Osama bin Laden living high, the high life in Obadabad, we've had our suspicions about Pakistan. Turns out they are disloyal, deceptive, and a danger to the United States. This so-called ally takes billions in U.S. aid while at the same time supporting the militants who attack us. According to Admiral Mike Mullen, the Pakistani government supported the groups who were behind the truck bombing attack that wounded more than 70 U.S. and NATO troops and the recent attack on the U.S. Embassy. Mr. Speaker, this should be the last rodeo for Pakistan. Last night, I introduced legislation to freeze all U.S. aid to Pakistan, with the exception of funds that are designated to help secure their nuclear weapons. By sending aid to Pakistan, we are funding the enemy, endangering Americans, and undermining our efforts in the region. We pay them to hate us, now we pay them to bomb us. Let's not pay them at all. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? To address the House for one minute. Gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to support the Palestinian Authority's bid for statehood of the United Nations. Supporting a Palestinian state is the right thing to do, and now is the right time to do it. It is wholly consistent with American values. We have supported people's aspirations for freedom and democracy around the world, and we should not treat the Palestinian people differently. There is, a glo there is global support for a Palestinian state. More people around the world support a Palestinian state than oppose it, including Americans. Seventy percent of Israelis would accept a Palestinian state if the U.N. approved it. Last year, President Obama said that it, he hoped to see a Palestinian state admitted to the United Nations. Previously, Palestinians sought statehood through violence and terrorism, which the world rightly rejected. 
and now they are nonviolently following internationally recognized process to gain statehood. Why are we discouraging them? A Palestinian state is in the national interest of everyone. It would help stabilize the Middle East. It would help end Israel's diplomatic isolation. It would deal a devastating blow to Al-Qaeda and Hamas, which refuse to recognize Israel. Gentlemen's recognizing the Palestinian state, recognizing Palestine besides Israel would reaffirm Israel's own status. Gentlemen's time's expired. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Mississippi rise? Again, to address the House in one minute. Gentleman from Mississippi is recognized. Mr. Speaker, since the first honor flight to bring World War II Air veterans from the Mississippi Gulf Coast to Washington, D.C. on May 11th, almost 200 veterans have had the opportunity to see the memorial built in their honor. I was privileged to walk and speak with the greatest generation this week as they remembered the sacrifices that preserved our freedom and liberated the world from tyranny and oppression. This generation of men and women fought and secured America's future with unwavering courage. Their selfless sacrifices to their country and stories of heroism inspired future generations to join the armed services. In my life, it was my grandfather, a Marine Guadalcanal veteran, whose story encouraged me to join and serve in the Marine Corps. As we honor those who fought to protect America's exceptionalism, I also want to recognize those honor flight volunteers who worked so tirelessly to preserve the legacy of the greatest generation. I yield back. Thank you. For what uh, purpose does the uh, gentleman from South Carolina rise? Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent to remove my name as a co-sponsor of H.R. 639, the Currency Reform for Fair Trade Act. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Are there further one-minute requests? Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, is recognized for 60 minutes as a designee of the Majority Leader. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this uh, marks the, the first of what I hope to be many times to address uh, you and my, and my colleagues on, on an issue that uh, I have been graced with uh, get, having the responsibility to deal in the public policy arena about, and that's the whole issue of nuclear waste. Now, when people talk about nuclear waste and this debate about where it is and why it's there, they primarily talk about our nuclear utilities. And especially after, after Fukushima, Diachi, and people understand that when you store high-level nuclear waste on sites and if there's a disaster that occurs and if the pools run dry, then you might have a melting which might spread radioactivity, and that's not good for anybody. And that's a good debate to have because we have nuclear waste stored all over this country. But I'm not here really to talk about the private for-profit sector, the nuclear industry today. I'm here to tell another story. Another story that, that really talks about why we have government and why there's still a need for some government entities. Back in the World War II, and we just heard my colleague talk about the honor, uh, the, uh, honor flights. Back in World War II, we decided as a nation to win these wars. One way to make sure that we wouldn't lose thousands upon thousands of soldiers in invasion of Japan was to develop the nuclear bomb. Two were dropped. Uh, the war ended. Many people historically know that that's the development that occurred because of the Manhattan Project. What I think a lot of people don't know is that we still are dealing with much of the history of winning the war in the, Manha the Manhattan Project. And that winning the Cold War relied upon a strong military and a, no a strong nuclear deterrence. 
So we, even after World War II, we continued to develop nuclear weapons, which we deal with today. So I had a chance to visit uh, during our last district work period. I, I took a day and, and visited a place called Hanford, Washington. Hanford, Washington was part of the Manhattan Project. Manhattan Pro the Hanford was the uh, site that the U.S. military picked to help produce plutonium. The Fat Man bomb was developed there. And it was picked there for a lot of reasons. It was, uh, uh, there, was wasn't, there wasn't a lot of people there. Uh, as you can see, there's the Columbia River is right next to it. You had some low-cost power production. And so it was a good site. And hence, people got moved off the land. The government took over. And the government's been controlling hundreds of acres in Washington State even today. The result of the, the Cold War and winning World War II is that millions of gallons of nuclear waste now reside in Hanford, Washington. And I'm not exaggerating. In fact, 53 million gallons of nuclear waste is on site. And what's interesting about Hanford, of course, when they, you, started, you started storing this nuclear waste, our technology, our information, our, our knowledge was not uh, as great as it, it is now. The way we stored this material now would not be accepted processes today. It is an environmental disaster and a hazard that has to be cleaned up. You have approximately 174 storage tanks. They, um, these storage tanks are from 750,000 gallons to a million gallons, all with nuclear waste in these, these tanks. These tanks are buried, as it says here, um, 10 feet underground and 200 feet, 250 feet above the water table, a mile from the Columbia River. And some of these tanks are leaking. Just not a good thing for us to have. And so the government is trying to deal with this one site of nuclear waste in this country. Why do I bring this uh, to, to before you, Mr. Speaker, and why is this important? Because in 1982, part of the process of dealing with Hanford was to pass a law. And the law was called the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. And in that law, it says, we've got a solution. We're going to collect all the high-level nuclear waste, and we have a storage facility that we're going to place it in. And that place is Yucca Mountain. Now, many of you may have heard about Yucca Mountain before. Uh, I've, I've visited it twice. New, uh, Yucca Mountain is in a desert, and it's a mountain. And so I do the side-by-side -side comparisons here. Right now at Hanford, we have 53 million gallons of nuclear waste on site. Yucca Mountain, which is a site we designed, we picked, we've uh, studied for decades. We spent $12.5 billion dollars. We currently have no nuclear waste there. The nuclear waste at Hanford is stored 10 feet underground. The nuclear waste at Yucca Mountain will be stored 1,000 feet underground. The nuclear waste at Hanford is 250 feet above the groundwater. The nuclear waste at Yucca will be stored 1,000 feet above the water table. The nuclear waste at Hanford is a mile from the Columbia River. The, nuclear, the closest river to Yucca Mountain is the Colorado River, which is 100 miles away. Now, I'll come back to this floor throughout the year and highlight different locations around the country of where there's waste and start pleading with my colleagues to help us stop two people the President of the United States, and Majority Leader Harry Reid. Majority Leader Reid has blocked our ability to continue to move forward 
and take nuclear waste from around this country and place it underneath a mountain in a desert. This location is exhibit number one. There is no more compelling location in this country that cries out for this waste to be moved than Hanford. In fact, in the cleanup process, the scientific uh, design of the cast that will be used to, to clear out these 53 million gallons of, of waste and, and put into uh, storage containers, they are designed specifically for Yucca Mountain. Again, we have spent $12.5 billion to prepare this site to receive nuclear waste. The House went on record this year on a vote in the uh, appropriation bill for energy and water and said, yes, Yucca Mountain is still where we believe high-level nuclear waste ought to go. And that vote was uh, 297 members voting to increase funding to complete the safety review of the DOA application so that Yucca Mountain could move forward. One senator is blocking this, one senator from the state of Nevada. But it's time for the other senators from these other states who are affected, regardless of their party, to say, I don't want this high level nuclear waste in my state. We have a federal law to move it to this underneath a mountain in a desert. And it's time for them to stand up and be counted. That's why this is my first trip to the well, identifying one location in this country. I think the most compelling argument for Yucca Mountain, and it's not even tied to that nuclear power generating uh, for-profit industry. It is tied to our World War II legacy and the environment and the health of not only the land here in Washington State, but also the great Columbia River. So who are we asking to stand up and be counted and help us move this? Well, we just happen to have four U.S. Senators. Two from the state of Washington, two from the state of Oregon. Senator Cantwell, Senator Murray, Senator Wyden, and Senator Merkley. Now, if you look at this site, the Columbia River, for those of you who know your geography, knows that the Columbia River, when it gets closer to the west side of the state, separates the state of Oregon and the state of Washington. To the north, north of the Columbia is Washington State, south is Oregon. These senators need to step up and plate. And these senators need to do their job. They need to speak to the majority leader. We understand the majority leader who wants to protect the state of Nevada. So I'm not trying to lift mountains that I can't personally lift. But what I can do is start making the clarion call to senators around this country who have high-level nuclear waste in their state when we have already spent $12.5 billion for a single repository, and as I've said numerous times, underneath a mountain in a desert. The numbers here in Washington, um, uh, on the House side, we have an overwhelming majority, and the other body, their majority is not as, as, as big as it once was. And because of that, these centers are even empowered more to be able to go to their leader and, and, and plead for their state and make the compelling argument. Uh, again, if you can't make it for Hanford, you can't make it for anywhere. Uh, I'm from southern Illinois. I don't have a nuclear facility in my congressional district, although I am from the state of Illinois. And Illinois is a huge nuclear power state. We have 
uh, six locations, 11 reactors. So we have high-level nuclear waste stored 40 miles from downtown Chicago. Now, does that make sense? Does that make sense in a day when we've already spent $12 billion to prepare, locate, research a single repository that, we, that can be kept safe, secure, and stored? It doesn't make sense. So that's why in the coming weeks you'll see other posters like this. I'll definitely keep this one. But we'll compare Yucca Mountain to downtown Chicago. We'll compare Yucca Mountain to Boston, Massachusetts. We'll compare Yucca Mountain to Savannah, Georgia. If you live in a state and may not have a nuclear power plant, you may very well have the legacy of World War II Manhattan type projects and nuclear waste that has to be stored elsewhere than in the place where, it's, where it is today. So as the chairman of the Energy and the Economy Committee, my congressional responsibilities is, is that of uh, nuclear waste. It is, a, uh, it is a challenge for this country. It is a challenge that we've already have a plan to deal with. In fact, rate payers of states that have nuclear power have been paying an additional charge on their utility bills to prepare Yucca Mountain to receive this waste. To have one man and a president who's complicit in his design to stop this is not in the best interest of this country and I will continue to come down to the well to fight this fight so that we take full advantage of the great resources we have and follow up on the planning and the funding that we've done for decades to, to have a single repository. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Texas Mr. Gomer is recognized for 45 minutes as a designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we're going into recess for a week. We passed a bill to uh, keep the government running. Uh, some of us were concerned that we were compromising with ourselves, um, but supposedly it was a bill that, though we compromised with ourselves, that the Senate could pass. Um, and now we find out they've tabled the bill. And now they're talking shutdown. It's extremely disconcerting when it seems that one group believes that the best way to win politically is to have a shutdown and blame Republicans. It's also disconcerting uh, to have a president come into this body here, speak to the House and Senate, stand here at the historic podium, and lecture this body on the president's job bill that didn't exist while he was lecturing us. was entirely consistent, though, with exactly two years before that, when the president's polling data showed that uh, people didn't think that the president's ideas for health care were good. And since he is such an incredibly gifted reader of speeches, uh, apparently felt if he came back to the House floor and were able to use the teleprompters and read to the body that he would be able to convince everyone to go along with uh, the government takeover of health care completely. And um, that day, he kept representing things about his bill 
this bill, my bill, this my plan, this plan. And there was no plan. There was no bill at that time either. So it's not was not terribly surprising that the president would come in here again two years later when polls are not looking good and tell us that we had to pass a bill that didn't exist. And he had a plan, but the plan didn't really exist. But eventually we got a copy of his bill, even though for six days nobody filed an American Jobs Act, so I went to the trouble of file, file one. I felt if the president wanted to fuss at us for not passing the American Jobs Act, there ought to be one. So mine was two pages, his is 155. But it's amazing, and especially with all the stuff going on with uh, Solyndra in California and the scandal that that's become, that this administration twisted and pushed and, and potentially distorted things in order to get half a billion dollars to a company who was not doing well or which wasn't doing well, and then turn around and turn the agreement upside down Secured creditors, those that provide the money, are, are supposed to be paid first in the event that um, um, there is not enough to go around for everyone, and yet there, somebody in this administration, may, maybe a number of somebodies, uh, it appears right now, changed the deal so that the secured creditors, the American taxpayer, the government, would not get back, paid back first. Um, you know, my days as a judge, a uh, district judge in Texas and chief justice would seem to indicate that that kind of thing is fraud upon the American people. Uh, the investigation is going on, so we'll find out more about that as it does. But it's interesting that in the president's so-called jobs bill that really will destroy more jobs than it creates. It's got these constant references to um, priority to the use of green practices, and it's got lots of provisions apparently that will ensure that any other cylinders out there, any other companies that are trying to um, get government money for a business that can't make it on its own, uh, but they're close enough with the administration. They feel like they could get loans. They could get grants for things that cannot be pers uh, commercially feasible. That this is the way to go, and we see that throughout the bill. I mean, uh, apparently half a billion dollars squandered uh, for crony capitalism was not enough. There's more provisions for that in the president's so-called jobs bill. Um, of course, we've got, um, you know, the... Uh, payback to unions and language in here for prevailing rates and that kind of thing. Uh, some folks that I talked to would be glad to have a job at whatever rate they could get. Uh, there are those folks. And yet, when the administration pushes a jobs bill that's going to make the prevailing wage, the price to be paid for wages, so high that a business cannot afford to hire those extra people, have we really done the American people any favors? We can't even create entry-level jobs because of what this administration keeps pushing and trying to heap upon the American people. And, uh, you know, there is a little bit of money for infrastructures. I say a little bit compared to the overall price tag, $450 billion dollars. You would think that we could do a little better than what the president's proposing. If we, he wants a $450 billion infrastructure bill, but the truth is it isn't an infrastructure bill. We heard the same language about the so-called stimulus back in January of 2009 that we needed bridges. Oh, and he, he talked about bridges back then. The bridge in Minnesota, this bridge, that bridge, they all need to be fixed, and, and we can do it. Uh, but we need this stimulus bill to do all this infrastructure repair. Well, it was kind of the bait-and-switch thing. Uh, 
I certainly didn't support that stimulus bill. I believe uh, Republicans were uh, unanimous on that. It was not a stimulus bill. You could see that. It wasn't going, there was such a small percentage going to stimulus uh, that we would consider true stimulus. Infrastructure, we do have failing infrastructure, roads, bridges, things that need to be prepared, sewage plants, different things. But um, that bill had just a tiny trickle coming out. And again, this is percentage wise. It really was not an infrastructure stimulus. The people were told one thing and yet got another. Now, one of the ways the federal government gets its control of people, state governments, local governments, is by throwing money out there and saying, here, we're going to help you. And once that money is received, they start getting all these strings that go with it. Now, if you're going to keep getting federal money, then you're going to have to start doing this, that, and the other. In fact, there's one provision in the um, president's so-called jobs bill that ought to sh send uh, shivers through people uh, in the state governments all over the country because there's a provision that says... Um, if the states receive any money at all from the federal government, basically for any program, then they waive their sovereign immunity, opening up themselves for lawsuits in yet another area where states have never been able to be sued before. So I'm not sure what jobs that creates. I know it helps the plaintiff's lawyers. Uh, and perhaps that's the whole goal of the president to uh, help plaintiff's lawyers, but what a disaster. Uh, nonetheless, we know that uh, Fannie and Freddie will in, may end up costing the country trillions of dollars, brought us to the uh, brink of absolute financial disaster. And so what does the president propose? Well, houses, maybe they get along 50,000, 100,000 or so, um, different amounts. Well, what costs more than housing? That would be infrastructure. When we talk about houses, we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands maybe. With infrastructure, we're talking about hundreds of millions, billions. So what does the president propose for that? The American Infrastructure Financing Authority. And the good news is that that will be and I'm reading from page 40 of the president's so-called jobs bill. It says, the American Infrastructure Financing Authority is established as a wholly owned government corporation. Happy days. Wholly owned government corporation. But if somebody's concerned that people that would be running the president's American Infrastructure Financing Authority that would start trying to uh, do the financing for these massive infrastructure projects. If you're concerned, they might not have good business sense. If you're concerned, they might not understand how an economy really is stimulated, how real jobs in the real private sector are created. You don't have to worry because the next page, page 41, says the board of directors, and this is just so exciting to read, consist, well, is consisting of seven voting members appointed by the president. Now there's excitement. The president has shown that when he picks people, well, okay, it's true that they come from universities and places where they have letters after their names, but do they really know how to create jobs? Well, so far, we've got a big, big old no. They don't know what they're doing. They have PhDs after their names, and uh, they just don't know what they're doing in trying to get the economy going, stimulating the economy. It's scaring investors these days. But the president will appoint the seven board members 
of the American Infrastructure Financing Authority. And I think it's a good indication, when you look through the President's bill, Mr. Speaker, it's a good indication of the aspirations and goals of this administration if the people of America will give them four more years. Because if you look, the federal government will be in charge of infrastructure. Well, we've seen how that worked with student loans. Uh, students, their parents, trying to uh, go to college, get college paid for. We know that college uh, costs have gone through the roof. I wanted uh, my three children to have the chance that I did to go to a major university. I didn't want them to be burdened with debt simply because I gave up uh, lucrative um, work and decided to try to help my state and country. So we took out student loans. You could take them from banks, from private lending institutions, and there were provisions for student loans. But under Speaker Pelosi and uh, this president, Harry Reid and the Senate's leadership, the federal government took over the student loan business. Well, I thank God that I got loans for my kids to go through college before we took over as a federal government the student loan business. Because I would hate for not just me, but anyone, especially from the opposite party of the president, those in power, to have to go begging to the Obama administration, please would you loan me money so my child can get a college education? We put the federal government in charge of who can get loans, who can get a college education? That's not what was intended for this country, to have the federal government make decisions on who can get educated and who doesn't. And I know that scares people sometimes to have uh, these examples brought up, but in 1973, that summer, I was an exchange student to the Soviet Union. I'd had a couple of years of Russian language, and I was an exchange student there. And one of the things that surprised me was in the Soviet Union, the federal government there decides who gets to go to college. They tell you who gets to go to college. Now, never mind that here in America, sometimes the most successful business people, some of the most successful scientists may have made some grades that weren't very good in college, but maybe came back in grad school and then really showed promise and did well. But it didn't matter. Maybe they didn't do all that great in high school, got to college and made good grades here in, in America, but in Russia, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what your inner drive was, that you had a yearning to help in health care, make some discovery in medicine. It didn't matter that you had a vision for how to create some new engineering work. It didn't matter because the government told every student whether you would be allowed to go to college or whether you would not, whether you would go work in the factory or whether you would go and teach. The government told people what they got to do with their lives and who got to have a college education. Now, I became friends with numerous of the Russian college students. I'm, I was impressed and I liked them very much. But I could not imagine such a system back then. And I was so grateful and thankful that I was from the United States I made good grades in high school and college and good enough to go to law school, but I just was so grateful. I lived in a country that really was the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's fantastic because when I had a yearning in my heart to do something and fix something here, I, I didn't have to beg the government will you please allow me to, to follow my life's goal, my life's pursuit? This is the only, it used to be the only country in the world where any parent could tell their child, 
you can be whatever you want to be. Now, we're kind of proud of Jamie Foxx in uh, East Texas. He grew up in Terrell, and I ran into him in Los Angeles last year and told him I was from Tyler, Texas. He said, Tyler, Texas. He said, you know, the thing, my childhood memory about Tyler, our family came over to the Tyler State Park. It's a beautiful park on a lake, one of the most visited parks in the state of Texas, the state parks. And uh, he said, you know, Tyler had the highest diving board I'd ever seen. I'd never seen one that high. And people told me, Jamie, if you can climb up there and go off that diving board, you can do anything anything you want with your life, anything. He said he was scared, but he climbed up there, that high diving board, and went off the board because he wanted to be whatever he wanted to be. And now he is so successful as a singer, actor, all these kind of things. You could be what you really wanted to be in this country, but it's scary to see that changing. And when I see moves in this country that I had nightmares seeing them happen in the Soviet Union, it's a little scary here. The federal government's going to get to tell people whether they can have a student loan or not. That's not a good idea. And yet the federal government just, we put under Speaker Pelosi's leadership, and the president's leadership, President Obama and Harry Lee, we put the private lenders out of business. Because the federal government, I guess they sold some people on the idea it would be politics free. Yeah, right. They would do a better job of picking out who should get a student loan to go to college. Couldn't believe those things came back. And, and seeing the socialized medicine in the Soviet Union back in those days, visiting med schools, clinics, and things, having a little need for health care back then, I was so thankful that in America we had so much better health care. And we didn't have to depend on the government to tell us what we could have treatment for, what we couldn't, what we had to get on a list to maybe get treatment for, what we couldn't. You know, this was America where people, doctors could strive to be the greatest they could be and to help humanity and then make money at the same time. I had one Soviet friend, college uh, friend that summer, who um, some lady ran off to tell on him, and I said, why would she do that? He said, well, in America, you can get ahead by working hard and, and making money, and money can give you power in America. Here in the Soviet Union, he said, the only way to elevate yourself is, self, is by stepping on others. They did, you saw it repeatedly. They couldn't wait to run tell government authorities on each other. They, basically, you could tell who was spying on an American who it wasn't hard to, to see, you could tell who was spying on the other students. wasn't hard to see. And I was grateful to be from the home of the brave, land of the free, land of the free and home of the brave. And I see things changing, and it breaks my heart. Now, well, another thing I observed in the Soviet Union back in 1973 was... Uh, we went to a daycare facility, and it was made very clear that children didn't really belong to parents in the Soviet Union. They were the property of the government. The parents would be allowed to keep their children so long as they trained them up in the way the government said. But if the government ever had one of these stool pigeons that ran in and reported that parents maybe were teaching children that they should strive to be the greatest they could be in what they wanted to do, for example, that was totally opposite of the government's teaching, and it would be a basis you're teaching them evil things. 
I had a student friend, uh, Russian friend, um, who was removed from the camp where I was because somebody told on him that he was being too friendly to me. He never said anything negative about his country, but we had frank discussions about a free market system compared to a socialist system. And they were very honest, candid discussions. And yet, he did nothing wrong, but he was removed, and he was told if he had contact with me again, he would be kicked out of college and go to work in Siberia or some other place that would be very unple unpleasant. I saw when a government controls people's lives. And I was shocked at daycare. And I was so grateful to live in a country where children belong to their parents. And the parents care, and the parents cared about seeing that they were raised up in the way they should go. And they may disagree with the government, and that's okay in America. But they could disagree with the government, and they were still not at risk of having their children removed. And now more and more with political correctness setting in in this country, people are told, you raise the children the way we say is proper, otherwise we'll take them away. And it keeps coming back as hints from what I saw 38 years ago. It's hard to believe this stuff is happening. When I look at the American Infrastructure Financing Authority, I see things down the road that this creates. And you can't help but believe that it will end up as the student loan business was. We create a federal entity run by the president's cronies that will make decisions on who gets lending for infrastructure. You could envision a day just like with student loans. Maybe uh, the private lenders still keep lending, and that goes for a while. But as we saw with flood insurance, the federal government got into the flood insurance market and said, you know what, these private lenders are not selling it as cheaply as we think they should, so we'll get involved to give them a choice. Well, what the private, lender, uh, private insurance companies found was they are not allowed to run at a loss for a long period of time. They go out of business, go bankrupt. Yet the federal government has no problem with running in the red. So the federal flood program has run in the red for years. It doesn't appear there's any hope that it will ever get to the black. And naturally, the federal government drives all the private insurance companies out of the business because the federal government can do it cheaper and run in the red. I can envision that happening with the American Fi Infrastructure Financing Authority. Mr. Speaker, you think about a day when a local government, a state government, has no lender that can lend on infrastructure because the federal government started small and got bigger and now nobody lends but the federal government. And once again, we create a situation. It's the potential, and if you don't look at the potential consequences of what we do in this body and the unintended consequences that can occur, we do damage to America. If the president had his way, and I feel sure that if he has four more years, there's a good chance he will, we'll have an American Infrastructure Financing Authority and eventually local governments, state governments, entities will have to come begging to the president or to the new czar of whatever it is and say, please, please, could we please have a loan to fix our roads or to build new infrastructure that our people are crying out for? Please, we promise we'll be good. We'll do what you tell us. God forbid we should get to a system that way, but we're on the way. We see it happening more and more. We dangle money out to states and local government through grants. You want to keep getting the grants? Do what we tell you. 
Founders never intended that. Never intended that. Bad enough that we set up a um, system where we order unfunded mandates of state governments. Before the 17th Amendment, things weren't perfect. They did need fixing. So I'm not advocating complete repeal. But there has got to be a way to restore power back to the states that it lost when state legislatures could no longer select the U.S. senators. And I'm aware there were some abuses there, but we have got to get a veto power, some leverage back to the states again so the federal government doesn't keep doing the kind of thing that this president throws out in his bill. And, of course, more and more of the airwaves are being moved toward broadband. So at page 75, something that tells you a lot about where this president wants to go for the future, he has the establishment of the Public Safety Broadband Corporation. But not to worry, page 76 points out, this establishes a private, nonprofit corporation to be known as the, quote, Public Safety Broadband Corporation, unquote. It says, and I'm quoting, which is neither an agency nor establishment of the U.S. government or the District of Columbia. But they will control broadband. So anyone that might have broadband coming in, maybe get television, computer, Internet, um, radio through broadband, well, guess who comes into your home or place of business through your broadband. It's control of the new Public Safety Broadband Corporation. You know, in 1984, there was that eye that looked out into every room from something hanging on the wall. It was Big Brother watching everything. How comforting to know this president wants Big Brother watching us through our computer, watching us through the means of broadband, but if you're worried, well, it, it says, this will not be, and I'm quoting, neither an agency nor establishment of the United States government of the District of Columbia. That's great news. So who will be controlling this new public safety broadband corporation? Ah, oh, we see that in the next section, a little further down in page 76. The following individuals or their respective designees, shall serve as the federal members. These are the people that will control the Public Safety Broadband Corporation that this administration wants to impose and inflict upon America, controlling all broadband. Well, you have the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Attorney General of the United States, the director of the Office of Management and Budget. Well, that's comforting, very comforting. Uh, there, are, there will be non-federal members, so they don't have just a total monopoly on control. In fact, there will be. The next section says non-federal members on the board. Well, who might they be? Well, the Secretary of Commerce, in consultation with the Secretary of Homeland Security and the Attorney General, shall appoint 11 individuals to serve as non-federal members of the board. Well, isn't that comforting? you got cabinet members appointed by the president, but don't worry, the president won't control all of it, although his appointees appoint the rest of them. And they are going to control the broadband. I think this is what America can expect when you have the president push forward a bill that for until I filed my American Jobs Act, there was no American Jobs Act down here in the House. And that's where it had to be filed because the Constitution requir requires all revenue-raising bills to begin here in the House. They have to originate here. So... Great news. I mean, mm, boy, if the president has his way, more and more federal control. Infrastructure, you need infra infrastructure. Well, isn't that, Rosie, you come begging to the federal government someday. 
but it's at page 133 as I'm moving through this bill that you find section 376, federal and state immunity, but it doesn't address federal immunity at all. It doesn't even touch federal immunity. Nope. It, uh, in fact, says, a state shall not be immune under the 11th Amendment of the Constitution from a suit brought in a federal court of competent jurisdiction for a violation of this act. Well, we don't have the constitutional power to waive sovereign immunity for the state. This is incredible overreach by the president taking away the sovereign immunity of a state not to be sued. We, he proposes a bill and says, not only am I proposing this bill, but I'm going to stick in a provision, it's here, page 133, that says states, you can be sued if you don't follow my law, my bill, to the T. Well, how could the federal government waive states' sovereign immunity? I can tell you, under constitutional law, the federal government cannot waive states' sovereign immunity. Only a state can waive its sovereign immunity. Under the federal, the federal government cannot have anyone waive its sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity is only waived for the federal government if the federal government decides to waive it. So how can the president stick in a bill that allows states to be sued willy-nilly under this, under this bill? It's in the next provision. A state's receipt of use of federal financial assistance for any program or activity of a state shall constitute a waiver of sovereign immunity under the 11th Amendment to the Constitution or otherwise to a suit brought by an employee or applicant for employment that pro it makes it clear okay he recognizes constitutional law the federal government cannot waive sovereign immunity for a state but the president says you know what if you receive one dime from the federal government for any program then that is an affirmative waiver of your right not to be sued under some bill that we make up here in my czar capital in Washington. Well, we also heard about, we had to go after the millionaires and billionaires. Now, as people have been told over and over, you know, CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, that scores bills, cannot score a speech. Unless, of course, the director gets called to the White House and intimidated, and then perhaps they will. But in the meantime, generally, you cannot score a speech. There's got to be a bill. So it doesn't matter what a president says in a speech in this body or as he spends millions and millions and millions of dollars running around the country telling people to pass a bill that for so long did not exist here in the House. Uh, what matters is what's in a bill. So the president says he's going after millionaires and billionaires. But if you look at page 134 and page 135, you find out what the president really thinks constitutes a millionaire or a billionaire. The top of page 135, well, bottom of page 134, it's subtitled 28% limitation on certain deductions and exclusions. Well, so who loses deductions? Who is going to get punished for making too much money? How many millions do you have to have before this president wants you punished and taxed extra? What does this president consider to be a millionaire or billionaire that's not paying their fair share that should pay more? Well, it's in black and white now. The president's bill says it applies to the taxpayers whose adjusted gross income is above $125,000 if you're married filing separately. So 
under the president's definition of who's a millionaire and billionaire, who's not paying their fair share, who needs to pay a lot more, it's defined here in black and white as a married person filing separately that makes more than $125,000. That's in the president's bill. And if you're married filing jointly, then you uh, get to be exempted unless you make over 250000 jointly as a couple. Well, two fifty as a two hundred fifty thousand as a couple, one hundred twenty five as an individual, is still one hundred twenty five. So, how about if you're single and you're not married? Well, good news there, you could have either a two hundred thousand dollar exemption or a two hundred twenty five thousand dollar exemption if you're single and head of the household. So it's potentially worth a hundred thousand dollars. To get divorced, the government is saying, you know, we'll give you an extra hundred thousand, seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars exemption if you'll just get divorced and live together. Now, I'm not sure who came up with this. Obviously, the president's waving the bill around now that uh, there's one printed, but he's advocating that you're better off financially, will reward you financially if you'll just get divorced and live together. Now, I'm not sure if that's his effort to placate people who want gay marriage. Say, look, you're financially better off not getting married. See, you're going to have, you got an extra $7,500,000 exemption if you'll just stay unmarried. So why would you want to get married? I don't know what his thinking was. I can't imagine why he would want to punish married people that are working hard and making this kind of money. But sure enough, that's in the president's bill. Happy days. And he's had talks before about eliminating the alternative minimum tax that was never meant to apply to the tens of thousands of people that it does. <laughs> Well, guess what? Page 135, sub subsection little c, b talks about additional amount. Subsection c talks about additional AMT amount. So we're going to add to the AMT. I know he said we were going to get rid of it, but uh, actually in his bill where you really see what he's thinking, he adds to it. Now, the biggest help for... Um, Independent oil producers is called uh, the deductibility of intangible drilling costs. These are the expenses of an oil company, an independent oil company, in producing a well. And there, it's the cost of doing business. Any other manufacturer that produces a product is allowed to deduct the cost of doing business. But this president wants to demonize those things and call them what they're not. He calls them a subsidy. They're not a subsidy. A subsidy, under any dictionary's definition, is in essence a gift or grant of money. There's no gift or grant to mo of money to the people taking these deductions. They get to deduct the cost of producing oil and gas. And when you find out that over 94% of the oil and gas wells drilled on the land in the continental United States are drilled by independent producers, not Exxon, not Shell, not the president's dear friends at British Petroleum, who were so ready to endorse uh, the cap-and-trade bill, uh, negotiating when to come out in favor of cap-and-trade the very day the Deepwater Horizon platform blew, losing lives, devastating the Gulf, but then at the same time giving the president a chance to punish states like Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, who had so many thousands of jobs lost when he declared a moratorium that has cost this country dearly by rigs having to leave American waters and go to other countries. And does that hurt the big oil companies? No, it means there's less oil and gas being produced, which means they'll charge more, make more profit. So taking out the most important deduction for independent oil companies will devastate them. 
And it doesn't even apply to the major companies he says he's going after. So once again, he says he's going after major oil, taking away their subsidies. Well, they're not subsidies. They're deductions for business expense. And on the other, what he really does in black and white in the bill, nobody has to take my word for it, he repeals the deductions that only applies to oil companies that produce less than 1,000 barrels of oil a day. It doesn't even apply to the majors. The majors don't get that. They're able to, to do such vast production that they can survive without it. The independent producers can't. And a lot of people don't know, like we do in East Texas, where uh, during World War II it was the largest oil field ever discovered in the world. But those mainly wells still being drilled there, a lot of it for natural gas now, being drilled by independent producers, produce less than 1,000 barrels a day. You can't go to a bank and get a loan to drill an oil or gas well. You can't. The odds are not good enough that it's going to be com commercially uh, productive. So what you do, most independents do, they'll say take 18, 25 percent, something like that, of their own well that they're going to drill, and then they will sell working interests in that well and get investors to put up their money because if, if an independent oil producer supplies all the money for their own wells, they hit three or four dry holes. It's what puts some of them out of business. So they're smart enough. They spread out the risk because it certainly is risk. And so they don't lose everything when it's a dry hole. Well, what Section 435 does is devastate the ability to raise capital through investors investing because it repeals the oil and gas working interest exception to passive activity rules. So the working interests don't get through the deductions passed through to them that they are normally allowed to do uh, for the expenses they invest. Well, it is any independent oil producer can tell folks, I've heard it over and over, you take away people's ability who invest to deduct for what they're paying in, they're not going to pay into that. The odds are too good that, you know, oftentimes the money they get back, if it is a commercial well, just barely pays the, uh, the amount of expenses. You don't pass through the deductibility of what they paid in, then it's a huge loss to them. So you're not going to have people investing like they do now. And it, and it is tough to raise capital, they'll tell you. Well, the president devastates an independent oil company's ability or gas company's ability to, to uh, raise capital. This bill will devastate America. It's a great example of the president and Senate leadership saying, we're going to do this, and they do something entirely opposite. Those who have ears need to hear. And with Gentlemen, that, I yield expired. back, Mr. Speaker.